conclusion uh, this morning. I think that Professor Lobel, who's teaching Con Law in room uh, 113, where we were supposed to be, did not get the memo. Uh, but fortunately, we uh, found another adjacent room, so this will have worked uh, very well. Uh, we're thrilled to have here, not just this morning, but uh, earlier this morning at the Dean Women's Hospital and later at the Center for Bioethics and Health Law, uh, Dr. Frank A. Uh, Chervenak, who is the Given Foundation Professor and Chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at New York Presbyterian Hospital of the Weill Medical College at Cornell University, which of course is in New York City. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Penn State, right around the corner, sort of, and his medical degree from uh, Thomas Jefferson University, uh, we won't hold that against uh, him. Okay. It was a Philadelphia school, but it's okay. Uh, and he served his internship in internal medicine at New York Medical College, and then a residency in obstetrics and gynecology, also at New York Medical College in St. Louis Roosevelt Hospital Center. And then he did a fellowship in maternal <coughs> medicine at Yale University School of Medicine. Uh, he's been chairman of the uh, department at uh, Cornell since the 99. 99. Okay. Well, geez, we've got an anniversary. We've got an anniversary coming up. You're better. Right. Uh, Dr. Trevenick has published over 200 papers uh, or co edited 25 uh, textbooks in this area. His research interests include ultrasound and ethics in obstetrics and gynecology and physician uh, leadership. He will be speaking today on the ethical and legal challenges of decision making during pregnancy. So, uh, Please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Trevanek, and uh, we will let the questions when he's finished. Frank, go ahead. Thank you. Alan, can I say thank you? It's a pleasure to well, be you. part of this group. I mean, what you've done through the years is put together an interdisciplinary group that, that, that's a model for all of us. I, I can tell you, at Cornell, with our disparate sites, uh, such a dynamic interaction would, would not be feasible. Style, and I congratulate you. Thank you. And this is this is a wonderful, wonderful group. And I thank all of you. It's a beautiful day for coming here. Uh, so so I, I hope that, that I'll discuss a few things, and I will leave time for your points of view and, and any questions. Now, let, let me stop by saying I'm part of a physician philosopher team. I know there's an active ethics program here. Larry McCullough is my better half. His primary appointment is at the Baylor College of Medicine, but I'm proud that he's on our, he's an adjunct professor in my department at Cornell. Now, I thought what would be best for this interdisciplinary group? I realize the lawyers here. This is a subject that interfaces dynamically with medicine, with ethics and law. And it's the challenge of decision making during pregnancy when there's impact and impaired capacity. What I will do in the few minutes we have together briefly, go over some historical background, some ethical dimensions, discuss different standards of physicians' disclosure obligations, patients' process of deciding, how we implement the informed consent process, how we deal with patients with diminished capacity, something I face as an obstetrician and physician. And then I want to sum up. We, we, we talk about commonalities between uh, medicine, law, ethics. I thought, let me make this interesting and state a few differences in different perspective. And I think this would be a useful starting point to our discussion. Two distinct issues have emerged under the modern concept of informed consent. Who should govern the patient and truthfulness with patients, especially the gravely ill? Now, given the rise of medical science in the mid 18th century, and it was only then that the physician had a claim to be a greater authority than health and disease than the patient. This was not necessarily implemented in the private setting where the patients clearly were in charge. Some would argue in some settings, maybe that's still the case. <coughs> Where this began to be implemented was at the Royal Infirmaries 
And I, I have to put this in perspective. At, at this time in, in 18th century, there were, there were marked class differences, as you can imagine, in Great Britain. And what I want to describe evolved into America. One view of truthfulness is that physicians should not be forthcoming with their patients. And indeed, this has been a traditional view in classic medicine. The only exception was you should be forthcoming with the family of the gravely ill, especially of male patients, so that they could get their affairs in order. And the competing view was that physicians should be forthcoming. So you realize this has been a contention for centuries in the history of medicine and medicine ethics. Now, consent developed gradually. There were contractual agreements between surgeons and patients in 18th century Britain. Patients could sue, and you're going to love this, Lawrence, please. Doctors could sue patients. I, I mean, please, it's a whole new cause of litigation. But, and what one that some of us in medicine would not be upset if you developed it? What, 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 would, what would be the cause of this? Well, if a patient didn't follow the doctor's advice and did poorly, he or she would hurt the doctor's reputation. And believe it or not, there are precedents in Great Britain where, patient, where doctors could successfully sue patients because they didn't follow the advice and hurt the doctor's reputation. John Gregory, who I'm fortunate to work with Larry McCullough, who's, who's a scholar in this area, changed the direction of, of where we were going with litigation and established that every man, back then it was men, men were in control then, has a right to speak when his home, health, and life are concerned. And, and probably this is the first appearance of patients' rights in the history of medical ethics. We, we talk about Hippocrates, but it was really great. It was the first time made this point explicitly and emphasized again openness to conviction and candor. That these were novel concepts in the history of medical ethics. In New York, in America, in 19th century, Dr. Alexander Skeen pioneered some of these concepts in surgery and gynecology here on this side of the Atlantic. Now, in the 20th century, in the first third, there was simple consent. Did the patient say yes or no to the plan offered by the physician? So there was consent, but it was a simple yes or no. Common law probably did not invent the concept of consent in the role of the patient as an authority. Informed consent was not a requirement imposed on law. And I want to emphasize this. Sometimes doctors think, what are the lawyers doing to us? No, 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 that is not the reality at all. Common law probably codified emerging ethical practice of making decisions with patients. So this is something that was developing this in the 19th and early 20th century. And I want to quote a case from my own hospital, the New York hospital, that whether we're doctors, lawyers, or ethicists, I think is the landmark decision in this area. And it's amazing to think it was less than 100 years ago, the famous Schlondorf decision. For any of the students here, this is one uh, precedent you need to be aware of. Mrs. Schlondorf presented to her gynecologist with what the gynecologist thought was a pelvic mass. There was no ultrasound back then. And what the doctor at my hospital, New York Hospital, recommended was an exam under anesthesia. And the patient consented to this. What the doctor then did, he did the exam under anesthesia, which was ether anesthesia. This is primitive anesthesia from today's methods, where there was a risk of killing the patient just from the anesthesia. And he found a pelvic mass. He did the medically correct thing. The medically correct thing was to take the pelvic mass out because it would have been dangerous to the patient to wake her up and subject her to another ether anesthesia. She got better, but lo and behold, she sued. And we'll be happy to see the audience of lawyers. There was, there was a cause of action. And this 
amazingly led to the famous Schlondorf decision that established informed consent that um, all people should not have procedures performed on them unless they give explicit consent. Now, I'm going to disappoint you. I know this is a legal audience. She didn't get damages because at the time it was considered that New York Hospital had sovereign immunity and damages could not be collected. So uh, that, that's been changed in, since 1914. But this concept that every person of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his body except in emergencies, this set the, for the next century or current century for informed consent. Now, this got refined over this past century. <coughs> Did the physician offer patient information about the patient's condition that was medically reasonable? And did the patient say yes or no to these alternatives? The concept of patient autonomy is introduced, which goes further than just simple self-governance. And the importance of respect for patient autonomy is an emerging theme during the past century. This is a broad-based overview of just a little bit of the history, but let's move on and talk about ethics. And I'll make a bold statement. I, I tell this to physicians all of the time. When it comes to medical uh, thinking, ethics is more important than the law. And by that I mean we live in a democracy, we obey laws, but a perversion that often goes on in obstetrics is where doctors try to outguess lawyers to avoid medical legal liability. We want to play game. Let, let me save this for question and answers. Maybe, maybe we'll discuss this more later. A doctor's duty to do what's best for his or her patient comes first. Ethics, as I would argue, is not about religious belief. It doesn't speak against religion, but it applies to all of us in the profession so that we need a secular ethic space so that we can relate to all patients. Primo non nocere, I think everyone in this room knows inside out. But what Larry has taught me, this ancient dogma, is really a Latin misinterpretation from the Greek. What much better captures what the Hippocratic writings are about is the concept to at least do no harm where the secular ethical principle of beneficence. Not benediction, nothing holy, but simply stated to do good for the patient. And this requires us to assess various options and to choose for the patient that which gives the greatest balance of goods over harms. It's a balancing. So when we spoke this morning at McGee Hospital about cesarean delivery, it's to use ethical parlance, it's a beneficence-based calculus. We judge the benefits and the harms of this intervention. Sir William Osler said it so much better than I could. The art of medicine lies in balancing probabilities and to do it with the best evidence that we have. A culture change in just one generation in medicine is no longer we say, well, we do this, I think it's best, is to base it on the best available evidence. The important counterbalance to this is respect for the woman's autonomy, and this accepts that the patient, and forgive me, a woman and man's autonomy, accepts that a patient has a perspective that is based on her values and beliefs, and the patient should have the freedom to choose alternatives. And justice deals with fairness issues, something that lawyers are very interested in important. This concept of prima facie obligations is so important. I know this has a special meaning to you as lawyers, but in ethics, what I want to emphasize, it means you don't take any of these obligations as absolute, but you, at first base, look at competing obligations, try to balance them, and adjudicate them. Now, the physician's role is primarily a beneficence-based role. Well, why do patients come to us? because we have an expertise and we may give medical advice, sometimes even strong medical advice, depending on the situation. Now, when it comes to autonomy, is the patient's fiduciary 
the physician has an obligation to provide the patient with information about the patient's diagnosis or differential diagnosis, medically reasonable alternatives for managing, and the benefits and risk of each alternative. So there's an autonomy-based obligation that's intrinsic of what it means to be a doctor, not just beneficence. The physician has an obligation to make a reasonable effort the patient can understand the information, and we'll get into some scenarios in a few minutes, that, she is, that he or she is authorizing and what she, he or she is authorizing. And we have an obligation to elicit the patient's preference and to implement that preference. I, I know this seems straightforward, but we're going to develop this in a moment where we give information, the patient understands the information, and a voluntary decision is made. The patient understands that he or she is asked to authorize management, and management cannot proceed without the patient's authorization. And I want to emphasize this. This may seem straightforward to you, but I, too many doctors think that you get a patient to sign an informed consent, and that's informed consent. In other words, I, I hate when it's used as an imperative consent the patient. Uh, a junior level person is made to get the signature. This is not what informed consent is. Informed consent is not an event. It's the process of mutual decision making by both the doctor and the patient with the, give, with the goal of building a therapeutic alliance. So the doctor and the patient work together to perform a cesarean or to do any intervention. Understand, the patient signs the informed consent, but this is, this is a bureaucratic requirement. True informed consent is the communication and interaction between the doctor and the patient. Okay. Let's move forward and talk about disclosure obligations. Three broad-based standards have existed in the legal literature and history. The first is the professional community standard. And this is what a group of doctors decide should be disclosed to patients. This could be local, national, or international. The problem with the standard is the can yield to underreporting of information. And there was a famous case, Nathanson versus Klein, where although the doctor appropriately did what other doctors uh, were informing patients at the time, it wasn't enough. And hence, this was an important issue. The reasonable person standard, rather than the professional community standard, is the legal and ethical standard for informed consent today in, in most jurisdictions. And what do I mean by reasonable person standard? If what information is needed by the lay person of average sophistication to make an informed decision that the lay person should not be expected to know. And there were cases throughout history, Canterbury versus Spence, where the physician didn't disclose necessary information. The clinical rule of thumb is that we disclose and explain clinically salient information. Not everything, but the important information. I mention this just um, to, to say that the subjective standard has not been accepted. This is an autonomy-based standard. And I would argue that I, I think it's a good idea legally this hasn't been accepted in different medical situations, like when I've made the argument that women should be informed about second trimester ultrasound, I could make a case for a subjective standard. But let's, let, let's move beyond that. This has not been accepted by the courts. And let's focus on the standard, both ethically and legally, that's the mainstay, the reasonable person standard. What this is, is we disclose the diagnosis, all medically reasonable alternatives in the alternative of non-intervention. And we discuss benefits and risk in these situations. So indeed, this is the standard of what, how a doctor should practice today, and legally, how a doctor should be held accountable. 
You offer non-intervention as a trial to avoid moral abandonment and the false flag of respect for autonomy. What's material information? What a person of average sophistication should be expected to know. So I keep on emphasizing true informed consent is not a bureaucratic requirement. It's the interaction that goes on with the patient. If the diagnosis is not known, disclose the differential diagnosis in areas of uncertainty because this information is the context required by the reasonable person to consent to the diagnostic workup. The general rule of thumb, if the information is salient in clinical judgment, disclose it. And disclosure should be transparent so that the patient can replicate this. I want to emphasize that doesn't mean you throw the cookbook at the patient. This morning, I gave some examples, and psychologists have actually looked at this. Too much information can impair what one and against this. So the challenges for us in medicine is to hone this down so that the relevant important information gets to patient and not to throw the kitchen sink when we consider informed consent. Now, there's been a recent extension of the reasonable person standard that uh, gets my physician colleagues very nervous, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see where this all lands. This is Johnson versus Copamore in the Wisconsin Supreme Court. When the outcomes of a procedure differ substantially from one physician to another in the performance of a procedure, this comparative information must be disclosed. I'd say this is ethically very sound. I think many of my physician colleagues are relieved that this has not been expanded nationwide, but I think ethically a good case could be made that it should be expanded in, in like so many areas, such as in vitro fertilization. If one area, if, if there's a center that does this, it's a profit center, and doesn't have statistics as good as other centers, this indeed, you could, you could see, there's an ethical argument for disclosure, but you could see how it could be made, there's a legal argument. Let's move on so we stay on track, the patient's process of deciding. The patient pays attention to what the physician is saying, and the patient absorbs, retains, and recalls information provided by the patient. The issue of cognitive understanding is so important. The patient reasons from present events to their future likely consequences. The patient has appreciation. Appreciate that these events could happen to himself or herself and has evaluative understanding where the patient can assess these alternatives in terms of his or her values and beliefs. In, in broad strokes, this is what the patient does in the process of deciding. If asked, the patient can explain her decision based on the completion of the previous components of decision making. And her explanation needs to make sense by reference to values and beliefs. How do we implement the informed consent process? Introduce the patient to the informed consent process is a process of mutual decision making. The days of literally in one generation where doctors would dictate to patients the plan of care, this is done. This is an interesting part of history. Elicit the patient's current understanding of her condition in alternatives, and this is so important. Listen for deficits in the patient's fund of knowledge and respectfully correct them. I don't want to play games with you. In other words, the relationship between doctor and patient, why is the patient coming to the doctor? The doctor knows information that can benefit the patient. So this is not a matter of equality in that setting. The patient is coming for help from the doctor. The doctor must correct cognitive deficits. And again, aim for the reasonable person standard of disclosure. We've got to work with the patient so she can understand, evaluate different alternatives, offer a recommendation. I want to make this crystal clear. 
It's a misread of medical ethics today that all of our counseling is non-directive. A lot of it's directive, very directive. God forbid I develop appendicitis when I leave here. I hope, I hope the surgeon's going to tell me we need to do an appendectomy now. There's nothing unethical with that. The basic rule of thumb is the greater the medical expertise, such as acute appendicitis, the more directive the counseling should be. The more uncertain we are, let's say experimental chemotherapy, then we're non-directive. That, that's a good rule of thumb. So when giving informed consent, it doesn't mean we're non-directive. Depending on the urgency of the situation and the degree of medical certainty, sometimes we're directive, very directive. The patient articulates his or her decision and it's implemented unless there are compelling moral or legal reasons to the contrary <coughs> in very rare circumstances. This approach routinely puts into clinical practice the legal and moral presumption of adult patients to have capacity to make their own decisions. Indeed, that should be the presumption. In dealing with the patient, the presumption is that they can do this. The time required for informed consent process in a sense, is an essential cost of appropriate care. And I think this is so important in today's day of managed care. No, no, no. And this came up in our discussion this morning. This is what it means to be a doctor today. The, the communication is just as important as the technology, is with ultrasound, or the surgery. Now, concerning refusal, it's important to respect, as some doctors have not in the past, refusal by itself is not evidence of diminished decision-making capacity. Rule out the most important course of patient refusal, refusals, error in communication. I, as chairman, like to get involved whenever a patient refuses. And I can't remember when the last time it was. It was not a miscommunication between the resident or the doctor. That This is so, so important. So the first approach to refusals is did the patient communicate, or excuse me, did the doctor or healthcare team communicate this effectively? Often two doctors give misleading, conflicting information to the patient. So problems in communication are a big reason for refusals. Implement the obligation of informed refusal. Truman versus Thomas uh, was important. What was this in 1980? And this was more, this is interesting. This was a case where a woman reviewed used a pap test. I, I think you're all aware a pap test is a common cervical screening test. I'm proud to say Dr. Pat McLeod did this work at Cornell years ago, and it was the um, uh, the vanguard of screening, not just in gynecology but all of medicine. And it's proven to be effective in screening for cancer of the cervix early on so it can be cured. <coughs> Ms. Truman um, refused a pap test. So then she went on to develop cervical cancer. And I say, what's the big deal? She refused and was accepted. No. Dr. <coughs> Thomas didn't explain the consequences of this. And sure enough, this is where the doctrine of informed refusal has come through that it's fine that if a patient refuses, but there's an obligation of the, patient, of the doctor to communicate and to explain the consequences of what it means to refuse such an information. It's critical you, you review the information and cognitive and evaluative understanding of the patient. If you believe that one or more alternatives are consistent with the patient values, point this out and ask the patient to reconsider. So sometimes we in medicine have tunnel vision and we believe only one option is the way to go. So often there's a splay of alternatives that can be done. Sometimes negotiation can be invaluable. Sometimes patients, and I'd say rarely, have diminished capacity. This is important. Um, is this is especially important. Sometimes patients do not have appropriate understanding. By engaging patients in the informed consent process, 
physicians are able to identify patients with diminished making capacity. Can they pay attention? Can they absorb, retain cool information, cognitive understanding, appreciation, and evaluative understanding? The, 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 in, in other words, it's, if a doctor isn't connecting with the patient, you have to see are there deficits in these areas. There are times where it's appropriate where you seek psychiatric evaluation for purposes of identifying the patient's problems and appropriately dividing up the clinical work and management of the problems with the goal of restoring the patient's decision-making capacity. But I want to emphasize this in my mind is slowed down in terms of frequency from miscommunications and errors of communication and um, lack of uh, knowledge base of the patient. True diminished capacity, just as a frequency issue, is less common than those other more common things. For patients with significantly division, uh, diminished capacity, then you turn to the legally appropriate surrogate decision making. And this can vary state to state, but usually, usually, the guardian, spouse, adult children, adult siblings, close relative, friend, or chaplain. But this could vary from state to state. I'm I, uh, not sure what the order would be here in Pennsylvania. Two standards of surrogate decision making. Substituted judgment, where you would ask the surrogate what would be important to the patient now, then go through the consent process with the goal of basing the decision on what the patient would prefer if the patient could express a preference. And the best interest standard, in the absence of reliable knowledge of the patient's values and preferences, select a medically reasonable alternative based on the health-related and other interests. So, so there are two standards that may have different application in different circumstances. Now this is important. Do not offer alternatives unless they're reliably judged to be medically reasonable. And this just doesn't go for patients with diminished capacity, but for all patients. Keep it as clean as possible with the informed consent process. You don't need a kitchen sink approach. This doesn't enhance autonomy. In fact, this can impede it. Patients and their families assume that if a doctor offers an alternative, it's medically reasonable. And I want to emphasize, it's not obligatory to offer an alternative just because it's available. So the topic I discussed this morning, patient choices area, I made a clinical ethical argument that it's not the duty of the obstetrician today to offer this to all women because it's not clearly supported by evidence. Now, with minor children, the concept of pediatric assent is important. Children should participate in decision-making commensurate with their developmental capacity. The more adult-like the decision, the child's decision-making process, the more seriously the physician and the patients should regard the outcome and the physician advocate for that outcome. And this usually applies to older adolescents. This is from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Now, a very useful tool, something that Larry and I wrote about over 15 years ago, is the concept of preventive ethics. To make decisions with the patient well in advance of the problem. This is important. It's especially important when you're dealing with a mentally impaired patient. And this is where you can remind a woman of her decisions previously made to enable reaffirmation. And it's worth a moment to discuss the Ulysses contract. This we have done with our psychiatrists in some circumstances. Let me refresh you. I'm, I'm sure you're much more knowledgeable in literature than I am. But I, I think you will remember the story of Ulysses when he passed the sirens. But being a true lover of wisdom, he wanted to hear the song. But he didn't want to pray it to his death. So what he did, he put wax in the ears of his whole crew. And he said, tie me down. And no matter what I say, don't release me. And sure enough, he passed the sirens. And Here's the song, and he's begging him, 
time he let me loose, I want to go to the sirens, and they didn't obey him. In psychiatry, there is such a thing as a Ulysses contract. That when a patient is lucid, agreements are made, so if he or she fades into not being lucid, that the former agreements have ethical and legal and medical standing. So, so there is a place for this in some instances. Now, considering whether to continue a pregnancy to viability in turn, the physician should be aware of one's own bias toward this. And again, this is not a matter for a physician to put his or her biases in this such a thing. The decision whether to confer or withhold the status of being a patient is a function of the woman's autonomy. Surrogate decisions should therefore be based on the substituted judgment standard. When the patient's values and beliefs cannot be determined, the best interest standard usually applies, but this has very limited applicability in pregnancy because the manageable health risk of continuing the pregnancy. So again, having advanced knowledge of what the patient wants is invaluable. During labor and delivery, it shifts a little bit. The fetus is a patient to which both the pregnant woman and the doctor have beneficence-based obligation. So the surrogate decision maker needs to take this into account and realize there's an obligation to the fetal patient as well in such a circumstance. So it may be appropriate that to demand a cesarean section would be reasonable. Concerning child rearing and adoption, the ability to rear a child oneself is distinct from the ability to make decisions about pregnancy. A physician's concern about lack of child rearing capacity should be conveyed to the social worker and other colleagues with expertise in this area. We, we have an obligation. If we have any doubt about a woman's ability to care for the child, we have an obligation convey this and get an expert evaluation. If their evaluation supports the judgment, then the, this is where law gets involved. And it may be, and not maybe, it is appropriate not to have the child go home with the mother in that setting. I know I'm moving quickly, but, but I do want to leave plenty of time for discussion and your thoughts on these issues. But, but a couple of words about the contrast between law and ethics in the informed consent process. Common law of informed consent developed in court tort cases brought <coughs> by patients against physicians, some of the classic cases I described. The focus was rightly on the physician's legal obligations of disclosure because physicians were defendants. And the issue was whether the physicians met the standard of care. And indeed, some of these landmark decisions broke new ground and advanced the whole informed consent theory as, as I tried to show. Little attention was therefore paid to the patient's role because the patients were plaintiffs, not defendants. Ethics, I would argue, to, to the clinicians even more important in the law because it goes beyond just the legal issues. Ethics go because it emphasizes both the physician's and the patient's role and the importance of the mutual communication. Canterbury states that a rough understanding by the patient will do. Grasping the outcome when it's clear, when necessary, is mechanism. This is sometimes not an ethic, acceptable ethical standard in relatively non-complex decisions. In other words, risk of paralyzing injury, that it needs to be made explicit to the patient not to get out of bed if indeed you're immediately post-op. In more complex clinical areas, <coughs> special perinatology, the cognitive demands on the patient increase because both outcome as well as mechanism need to be understood. And indeed, sometimes true informed consent with some issues related to prenatal diagnosis and management intrapartum management and decision making about a seriously ill newborn are very intensive discussions and very, very nuanced. As cognitive demands increase, 
there's an ethical obligation of the doctor to ensure that the patient's capacity for autonomous decision making, rough, rough understanding may not be ethically acceptable. Sometimes the level of understanding has to be nuanced and sometimes uh, medical decisions can turn on very minor details. In summary, what I've tried to do in the few minutes we have is give a very broad-based overview of this subject that I think is a beautiful subject that interfaces with law, ethics, medicine, the, the topic of informed consent. Let me open this up now. Let me get your thoughts, any viewpoints or questions. Thank you so much. to a fiduciary obligation both from the mom and the doc in terms of the fetus becoming the patient. Is that an area that the law should dictate how that obligation is parceled out? So let me get this right. Pennsylvania has a law that a mother's advanced directive should not be respected. In certain very certain specific circumstances, circumstances yes. Let me give you some thoughts on this. It's an excellent, excellent question. I would say prior to fetal viability, about 24 weeks, I would support such a law. I would say that prior to fetal viability, the core obligation is to respect the woman's autonomy. All of our wonderful technology is worth nothing without the woman's body as a conduit to establish the linkage between fetus and child the fetus will become. So prior to viability, I would explicitly support such a law and support her, well, to, to support a woman's ability to make an advanced directive which should be carried out. So I would oppose such a law, forgive me in such a setting. Prior to fetal viability, I think this should be a matter of a woman's autonomy. If she's incapacitated, then the substituted judgment with the husband, the, the guardian, or whoever, prior to viability, I would oppose such a law. And again, if she wants to establish a linkage, let's say that her dream is to have a child, then whatever her decision is, we shouldn't be biased in this, but she should not be forced to be a container to, in, in other authors have made <coughs> to cause viability. After viability, I think it even gets more nuanced. There I would argue that the doctor, society at large, and the pregnant woman has obligations to the fetus as a patient. So soon to be, let me make it easy. Let's take it toward the end of pregnancy. Let's make it 38 weeks. And again, Larry and I have made this argument in the literature. It's debated that a fetus that's soon to be born, um, there are obligations to that soon to be born child. So let's say for acute fetal distress, there, there are times when we have great obligations um, to such a setting, so that's where that law may have some sense, especially if there's some second party involved who may not want what the woman would want. Let's say well, my wife's going to die, the last thing I want is a child. So in broad strokes, that's what I would see. And I'd say prior to fetal viability, I'd say respect for the woman's autonomous decision, either through herself or through a surrogate, is determinative. Afterwards, it's, it's much more nuanced. And this is one of these situations it could turn on the medical details of the case. The famous Angela Carter case. Um, was a disaster because there there was a medical interest not to have a coerced cesarean. And, and um, if it, it, in, in broad strokes, in such a decision, you have to take account obligations to the pregnant woman, to the fetal patient, both beneficence and autonomy based. I, I hope I haven't made it too complicated. No, no. Prior to viability, the woman's choice, after viability, it's more nuanced. This would be an appropriate case for an ethics committee. I, I think by and large in obstetrics, there, 
very, very few and far between cases for an ethics committee. These are matters between doctor and patient. But if this happened post-viability, this is one where we need the lawyers, the ethicists, the obstetricians to work together. Absolutely. Yes, please. Um, I've been reading in the past about a month and a half about a national law that would allow just about all hospital employees, volunteers, to disregard a patient's choice based on their own personal moral beliefs. What do you think are the effects that's going to have on the doctor's ability to make an ethical decision? I love, I love it. In this month's American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, we've written about this. Larry and I have written about this very subject. And we make a distinction between a doctor's obligation to direct and indirect referral. What do I mean by this? I would argue that for a doctor who is morally opposed to performance of abortion, he or she should not have to perform an abortion. And I've argued this, in, indeed, uh, 15 years ago, there was a debate in our field that all doctors, there should be an abortion training requirement. I argued strongly against this. And I defend the private conscience of a doctor who does not do abortions. However, if someone's going to be on the front line, he or she has an obligation to make an appropriate referral. Not necessarily to a doctor, because that can involve a compromise of one's own moral integrity. So I don't have to make a referral to Dr. X for an abortion, but I do have an obligation to say you can contact Planned Parenthood and let them make the referral to the appropriate doctor. We made a case in the obstetric literature that it's a secular obligation of an obstetrician on the front line in such a circumstance to say that he or she doesn't do abortions, that's fine. Not necessarily refer to Dr. X, but say you can get more information with the third party, such as Planned Parenthood. I would argue that should be the clinical ethical standard. So if there's a law that doesn't say that, I, I would disagree with the law. Does that address? So we'll let her finish it. Then. Clear. Go ahead. I meant more along the lines of, like, not the doctor, mm -hmm. but in the news articles I read, they considered um, people that other people that have positions that are required for a surgery or something like that, like the person that sterilizes the instruments or like that. I mean, more like, what does that effect have on the doctor's ability to do this, to give the patient their full? I would say, let me, let's take it step by step. I would say a nurse who's morally opposed to abortion should not be employed in a situation where he or she might, that might be demanded of her as a duty. I, I think in these instances, this all has to be disclosed up front so that it's made clear to a man or woman, if you're going to be hired in hospital X, then you, you may have to assist on the abortion. And I extend that to the person who sterilizes the instrument. If that person is so morally opposed to abortion, then he or she may not be able to perform that function in that hospital. Again, I think the challenge is that we respect the private conscience, the private beliefs of everyone. But there's a secular ethic. He or she has a duty to not obstruct either. Yes, please. As a layman, I want to ask if the uh, distinction you make with Larry on the indirect referral and the Please. example of uh, suggesting somebody go to Planned Parenthood, um, are there any emergency situations where that introduces a delay that might be uh, dangerous to a woman and where you might need to actually say the doctor in the bay next to me here in the emergency room can do this life-saving procedure? Thank you. Excellent question and so important. Absolutely. If there's an urgent medical indication, you have a duty to refer the patient. And, but, but can I tell you, this is not what we're talking about with elective abortion. In other words, if it's medically indicated, please, uh, there's a duty of everyone to take care of the patient. Um, and indeed, even the, the more conservative theologies, many would not be opposed to that. I mean, it's a life-saving measure, um, such as a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. 
is, is the classic situation. So the direct answer to your question, absolutely. Indirect referral is for the overwhelming number of these cases that are purely elective procedure. And I would argue to those who would claim religious exemption is, wait a minute, you have a duty to not obstruct. You're on the front line from a secular ethics perspective. You don't have to refer to Dr. X, but at least inform the patient plan. You, they could go to Planned Parenthood for more information. And I, I think the burden would be on those who would argue that this is indeed, um, yes, please. Now, just going back to the referral issue, uh, it's my understanding of, in a lot of places up in the Northwest, you can have entire states where, you, where the only gospel may be this place of the doctor who wants to make the indirect referral. The extent that your doc, that the indirect referral will take, will pretty much kick the woman out of the entire state, does, does that not create an obstruction? Ah, uh, you, you bring up an interesting, interesting question. Uh, do, do communities have the obligation to provide abortion services? That, 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 that's a tough one. That, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I, I would put it this way. I would say that, let's say, uh, what, 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 what community are we talking about? Let's say North Dakota or somewhere. Um, a doctor who is morally opposed to abortion um, does not have to perform the abortion, but needs to provide information about where an abortion can occur. I, I mean, where, what would be the obligation? I don't believe it's the doctor's obligation to send her to the place. It may be the obligation of the hospital. I would say it may be the obligation of this community hospital to provide access to abortion, but not that doctor who's morally opposed. Go ahead, now, please, please. Now, analogy, taking that and compare with uh, conscience clauses as opposed to pharmacists, where the pharmacist, to my understanding, is required to dispense or be out the job. So, I, I, again, case, but it, it's reasonable for a hospital to say, look, if <laughs> we're going to hire a pharmacist, he or she has to dispense the medication. And that's a job requirement. I, I don't see any anything inappropriate for a hospital to make that part of the job requirement to be a pharmacist in our hospital. Part of what that job entails is to dispense this medication. If that person is so morally opposed to this, he or she may not be able to work in that hospital. Except you have two people who are both doing pretty much the same end results, but one person's conscience gets a it's a much bit greater pass than the other. Well, wait, wait, wait. The, the one person can, can kick the per kick this kick the person seeking services out of the state, while the other one has to do the job. Okay, no, no, but but it's not the person; it's who's employing the person. In a lot of these communities, abortion services isn't only the scarce resources to get a real doctor who can do deliveries or, or other services. So. The hospital may decide we may need a doctor to do the obstetric services, and then there may be a duty of the hospital to pay for the transportation and to facilitate the abortion services elsewhere. I keep on coming back. It's it's it, it has to do with the nature of the employment. It's it's not necessarily the individual, it's the duty of who's employing the person. And it's, it's like um, the, the hospital may decide we could accommodate a pharmacist who doesn't do this. We have a backup system. Let's say it's, it's hard to get qualified pharmacists. But, but I'd say that core obligation to provide the service is not necessarily with the doctor or the pharmacist. It's with the institution. Yes, sir. Please. Can you um, explain secular ethics? I'm not sure I understand what you mean by that, and, and as secular ethics as opposed to what other kind of ethics. Thank you. So, so important. Truth Engelhardt does, deserves the, 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 the credit for, for, for that term. In the sense, secular ethics means an ethics that doesn't necessarily depend on religious tradition. 
Uh, for much of the history of uh, ethics, it's based on moral theology. Uh, theologians, um, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is bad or inappropriate, but the problem with religious ethics or moral theology, it applies to that particular faith community, whatever it is, Judaism, Catholicism, Christianity, Islam, but it's not generalized, not necessarily generalizable to other faith communities. By secular ethics, we mean starting from ethical principles that don't necessarily require a religious basis. It doesn't negate a religious basis. For example, in Epicence, some people, they're religiously motivated to do good based on a religious conviction. That's fine. So, so I want to emphasize, it, it isn't speaking against religion. It doesn't require religion. And that's the basis for establishing an ethic that applies to all of us in the profession, whether we have a religious belief or not. So how do you decide whether this particular point is secular versus based in religion? And, and if, if you want to use abortion, that's fine, or whatever yeah. topic. How do you say, oh, that's a religious ethic, so we have this other obligation, versus that's a, an ethic that we should abide by all the way around? Excellent, excellent point. The, the hallmark of secular ethics is to start from ethical principles that are generalizable to all religions and all traditions. If you start from a premise, let's say, right to life, then this is not generalizable. And I would argue at the other extreme, a, a right of bodily integrity, uh, an absolute right to bodily integrity, let's say, uh, a categorical denial of any obligation to support the fetal patient. I, I would argue these are not generalizable. And hence, these may have application for that limited group, but um, they're, they're not the beneficence, respect for autonomy, justice principles that are, are the cornerstone of modern ethics and, and basic generalizable virtues. We've talked about principles, but basic virtues such as self-sacrifice, compassion, professional integrity. Principles and virtues are the hallmark of a secular ethic. When the, I, I, I hope I'm not confused when I use the term secular. It's not against religion. I, I yeah. appreciate that. I'm, just, I'm not sure how you draw the line. Yes, certainly various churches and beliefs advocate pro-life, etc. Yeah. And, and, um, but I'm not sure how you say, okay, so that's just a religious issue versus a secular issue. And can't you be pro-life without being, you know, Catholic or whatever, that kind of stuff? I mean, to be, be an atheist and be pro-life or whatever. You could, you, you could, um, but you face the burden of counter-argument from those who would argue sure, from there's arguments on both sides, on a lot of sides. Things, where's the line between religion and, and secular in terms of an ethical belief or principle. I, I'm just having trouble. It, it has to do with the premise. You're, you're, you're right. There, you could make an argument for right to life that doesn't use religious principles. I would argue in secular ethics, that's a, a, a contested losing argument. I, I, I mean, so, so there are several categories. There's not just religious ethics, there's secular ethics, and within secular ethics, what can be defended and supported and what's on the defensive. I, I hope I've made that clear in a different category. I, mean, I hear what you're saying. I, I'm still struggling with where you draw that line and how you make that decision. That's all. Let, let's go back here because we need to adjourn soon. I just have a, a question. I'm very intrigued by the, when you look at the categories of beneficence and moral theology, and you look at the ethical consider autonomy subservient to beneficence. I consider them prima facie obligations. That means they need to be balanced in different 
clinical circumstances. So let's extend this to the case that you started with with the first question. Prior to viability, I would place respect for the woman's autonomy <coughs> to be the dominant ethical consideration in that setting. After viability, then it's a much more nuanced issue because then we as doctors have a social role. After viability, there's much we can do. And then, I'm not saying beneficence automatically trumps autonomy, but it needs to be factored in and balanced. Please, doesn't that control? Does that control no, it's okay. control back over to the doctors to decide? Oh, it's tricky. It's tricky. But, but let me just say this. I, I, the argument for shared decision making here is that toward the end of the pregnancy, the woman has to do sherry obligations to the fetal patient as well. And in other words, again, I have to just contest a little bit. The nature of the relationship of a pregnant woman to a term fetus is not one of freedom, it's one of obligation. So it depends on the particular issue, what's going to be determinative here. And, and, and that can get very, very subtle. Thank you. We're going to have to go on that too. Alan, I hope we've stimulated some thought. Sounds like they have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.